Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Curry. In my podcast, I interview extraordinary people and pick their brains. Each episode will feature a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a different perspective on the many paths that can lead to a rich and fulfilled life. This includes their favorite books, morning routines, exercise habits, trade secrets, nutritional philosophies, and their overall take on happiness and success. My goal is to find out where those amazing people get their holistic results from so that you and I can use their tactics and go kick ass in life as well. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. If people ask you what you do, what do you say to them? Uh, so it, I guess it depends on the context and, and how much time I have. Uh, the short answer is I'm a professor, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, if you tell people you're a psychologist, they think that you're the kind of psychologist who's analyzing them and cares about their problems. And I, I try to put people at ease and tell them I don't actually care that much about their problems. Um, I'm a, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I've spent my life studying the way people think. And, uh, I, I split my time between writing papers that get read by 30 of my closest colleagues and, and trying to teach other people who have minds about how their mind works so that they can live their lives differently and hopefully better. And, and so for the last, you know, 14, 15 years, I've, I've tried to reach out beyond just my fellow academics and, and try to share some of these insights about the way minds work with, with everybody else. This was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because so many great thinkers of our time and professors focus so much energy on writing papers and, and I really believe that psychology belongs to everybody and in order to read those papers, uh, papers you really, really have to have studied a couple of years and those people are already kind of successful in their life in that way and I think just the everyday Joe would benefit so much from learning like basic psychology. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think we have a, a, a duty to do both pieces, right? I, I think that it makes you a better communicator about the science if you actually do the science. So while I'm, I'm forever grateful to people like Malcolm Gladwell, who made the world safe to communicate about psychology, uh, I, I think that, that, that a lot of the reporters who have gotten involved in communicating about psychology don't necessarily speak the field like a native. And, and so having more scientists involved in that kind of, of discussion is important. And so writing papers for, for that small audience is important, but also getting outside of that audience and, and speaking to everybody else is also important. I agree so much on you. I studied uh, behavior under BJ Falk from Stanford oh, University, yeah. and we had a lot of conversations about Charles Duhigg and that he brought the topic of habits to, to so many people. But when you look at it through the eyes of psychologists, there's some knickknacks here and there. They are like, ah, oh, uh, technically this is not so correct. And there's more to it. I, uh, yes, uh, that has been a great source of frustration for me, particularly because his book came out about six weeks before mine mm. and, uh, and sold better. <laughs> <laughs> I've read, but I've read both. And, uh, I think yours is better if I'm, if I'm honest, it's like, yeah. But it, there's like a huge advantage for if you're a writer already and not if you started as a psychologist and then become a writer. Um, you have a great interest for studying people. In retrospect, do you remember a moment uh, where you fell in love with psychology? So I, I was actually a cognitive science major as an undergrad. Uh, and and I, I did not take a lot of psychology classes. I, I think I... If I had been born 20 years later, I might have ended up in, in artificial intelligence and computer science. Uh, most of my coursework was actually computational, but I, um, computers were kind of slow and stupid in the 80s when I was in, in college. And, and I, I just I think that they weren't up to the, the task of doing really nifty things. And, and so I. Uh, I remember actually being in a in a graduate seminar as an undergraduate uh, on robot planning. So so that the professor was teaching us about how to write algorithms that would help a robot to plan a series of actions. And we read a paper that started with a brief little psychology experiment and then continued on to develop a, a computational system that was related to that. 
And the professor made a kind of a disparaging comment about about studies, about experiments. And the grad students in the class, I guess, because they were sucking up to the professor, all laughed. And I, I actually stopped the class. And I said, wait a second. It was a little seminar. I said, wait a second. And I proceeded to give a five-minute impassioned defense of doing experiments on intelligent behavior if you actually wanted to model intelligent behavior. And as I got these horrified looks by the professor and the other students, it began to dawn on me I might be a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, and after that, I applied to graduate school in psychology and, and went to ended up at the University of Illinois in their psych uh, program. One thing that I, that really fascinates me about you is that you don't come along as an extremely serious guy. You are. I heard you're a saxophone player. You're a family man, and you have this this very almost playful side to yourself. But something that you see on the second look is that you must also have an extreme ambitious side about you. Do you, do you, uh, how do you balance those two things out? And do you remember when you first realized about yourself, I, I want more than others? Uh, you know, that's interesting. I, um, I think I've always wanted that. I mean, I, I think I, I, you know, growing up, thought, well, you know, everything around me must be the best, you know, and it, it wasn't right. I mean, it was just like, right, a normal kind of, you know, middle class upbringing. My mom's a teacher, my dad's a, an accountant, but I just sort of assumed that we were like a special, you know, family and, and all that. And, and, uh, and, and I think that, that, that led me on the one hand to, to, to want to do the best that I could, uh, in whatever I did. On the other hand, um, you know, I, I I think it was also important not, you know, to 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 take life seriously, but not necessarily to take myself so seriously. Um, you know, I, I think that 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 there's you you can you can have ambitions in your life without necessarily thinking that it's a zero sum game that you have to step over everyone else to get there. That that and that and that you can't. I, you know, I, I think in the end, you you know, our relationships with other people are important, and and if we if we step on other people in the process of getting the things we want, I'm not sure what we've actually achieved. So, it it I think both of those were were always a part of it. I think, uh, and 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 I I've I've tried to stick with that. I mean, and 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 you know, it's it's you know, you asked me earlier. Right. Uh, uh, you know, sort of offline here. Why? Why? You know, I would accept an invitation out of the blue to, to talk to somebody. And the answer is, well, because, you know, that's that's how you that's how you connect with people. And, and you know, if you if you only do things um, for people who are somehow ahead of you on some mythical food chain, you're you're not really playing the game the right way. You know, it's the, 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 the whole trick is, is, is for us to share what we know and share what we can do with each other and not you. you and, and I think that's actually a recipe for success for everyone. That's beautiful. But now you are kind of, I know that you very emphasize that you're still a learner and that you also want to uh, broaden how your horizon. But now that you are a teacher also, do you have some teachers in your life that accelerated your growth that come to mind some mentors or teachers or family mentors yeah i you know i've i've had i've been lucky enough to have all sorts of people in my life i mean uh, you know certainly my i learned a tremendous amount from my parents even growing up you know uh, about you know before it was fashionable my mom was always teaching about what became known as the growth mindset you know from that, Cara Drake, that, i know that yeah, yeah and carol carol was a colleague of mine uh, at, at columbia when i was teaching there um, and, uh, and, you know, and my, and my father, I think taught me a lot about, about leadership, uh, you know, and, 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 and so, so certainly I had that growing up, but, but, you know, even beyond that, I mean, I think my, my undergraduate, uh, uh honors advisor, Jim Anderson, who was one of the early neural network people, you know, I just, I learned a lot from him about, about, uh, you know, about cognitive science as a field. My graduate advisors, Doug Medine, Dedry Gentner, um, taught me a lot about the field and, uh, and, 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 and how to, how to do good research and to think broadly about, about ideas. So, yeah, I think, you know, and, and I taught at Columbia for five years, Columbia university and had a bunch of great 
teachers there, Tori Higgins and, and, and uh, Bob Krauss and Walter Michelle, and, you know, who I just, you know, they were my colleagues, but I learned tremendous amounts from, from all of them. And, and that's, you know, I've just been lucky enough to be surrounded by interesting people and, and people who were willing to share what they knew with me. And, and you know, so I, I feel like, uh, you know, I got, I got to return the favor. Walter Mischel was one of your teachers. Well, he was he was on the faculty at, at uh, Columbia, teaching there, and yeah, he was incredible. I mean, you know, that's the thing. I mean, all these people who 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 I got to just be around, uh, and 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 you know, Stan Schachter towards the end of his life it was still hanging around the psych department. He had retired, but he would come to he would come to to the to the seminars, and uh, you know, if we had an outside speaker, and he would always ask the first question. You know? It's beautiful. It all comes down to environment, and um, I, you seem to kind of have figured out something in your life. I'm sure you also have your failures and struggles, but do you remember a time in your life where this wasn't the case? If it's too personal, you don't have to answer, of course. I don't know. I mean, listen. I, you know, I think I think that 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 every everyone has both successes and and failures. You know, I went to college. Uh, thinking I was going to study economics or physics. And uh, as I like to say, I took economics and I didn't like it. And then I took physics and it didn't like me. <laughs> and uh, I passed, I, I took the, the freshman physics class I took. I I shouldn't have passed it. I, I the, the professor gave me a passing grade, I think, as a gift. And uh, and I remember calling my, my father and saying, I think I, I basically failed this class. And he said, he said, well, did you did you try? I said, yeah. He said, well, then you'll, you'll get it next time, you know? <laughs> and, and that was great. You know, it was that recognition that, that, you know, it's, it's not always about succeeding on the first attempt. Uh, you know, I've had, I've, you know, I've had plenty of papers rejected from journals. I've had plenty of experiments that didn't work. I've had, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there was that old, There was that old uh, Nike commercial, I think, that, that with Michael Jordan, you know, where he talked about, uh, you know, about about how he's failed over and over and over again. You know, he lists all the shots he's missed and all of the other things and 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 ends with, you know, I failed over and over and again in my life. And, and that's why I succeed. And I, you know, I I'm a believer in that. There's also in in uh, in I think it's in Smart Change. I quote that that poem by by Pete Hine, the, the one that's called The, the Road to Wisdom. Um, the, which, which, which is really short, right? It goes, the road is, is the road to wisdom is easy and simple to express to err and err and err again, but less and less and less. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. Right. I mean, to me, that's, you, you know, it's, it's not, it, it's not about succeeding in, in everything you do. It's about, about just trying stuff and getting better at it. I mean, I, you know, I took up the saxophone in my mid thirties as a way of, you know, I mean, trying something new and I was terrible. Uh, you know, when I, I mean, my, my, My son, uh, my oldest son walked out of his bedroom the, the first morning after I, I, he, I put him to bed and I and I, I started practicing my saxophone. And the next morning he got out of bed and he said, were, were you playing your new saxophone last night, daddy? And I said, I said, yes, I was. He said, he said, I thought so. It sounded like you were moving chairs in the kitchen. <laughs> Oh God, kids are brutally honest. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, that I think I think that's you know, that, that was great, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's good to know that you, 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 you know, you can, you can, you can be really horrible at something and, and that there's nothing wrong with that. Totally agree. And funny that you speak of Michael Jordan. I grew up as a basketball player and oh. before I ever laid one foot in a university, the biggest dream of mine was to become a professional basketball player and I had this, this one particular coach who every time I felt high about myself, he told me like, uh, If you're the best player on the team, you're on the wrong team. Like emphasizing <laughs> that, uh, yeah, before if you are like the best guy, then you should move to the next level in some sort of way. Uh, um, right. Art, could you tell me a little bit about your current projects? Well, let's see. So, so in December, I became the executive director of a research institute here at the university called the IC Squared Institute, which is uh, focused actually on innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, and so I've been leading a, an effort to to begin to study um, rural areas and small cities and trying to understand how what it is that drives people to live in those areas and, and, and to and to do economic development, which is, you know, a little bit different than the standard kinds of 
psych experiments that I've that I've spent my career doing. But um, but it's uh, it's an important topic, and and uh, I like. I like bringing people together to study things, and, and this institute has some resources that allows me to, to, to bring together a variety of research, researchers and, and, and help support some of the things that they're doing and, and to meet a lot of people and, and take some of the things that I've learned over the years and apply them to, to a topic that I think is really important. You know, we have, we have you know, in the United States, about 18 percent of people live in in, in rural areas and, and a lot of people also live in smaller cities and, uh, and, and those rural areas and smaller cities are have been left behind. And, and this is true, not just here in the, you know, not just in the U S it's true around the world. The, the rural areas, the smaller cities are, are falling behind and, and we see political divisions growing up as a result of that. And we see tensions. And, and I think, you know, we can take the kinds of research we do, whether it's psychology or sociology or anthropology or, or you know, research on, on engineering or science or, uh, you know, harder sciences or, or policy. We, we can take that research and, 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 and use it to, to help change the lives of, of those people. So that's, that's one of the big things that I've been, been doing right now on the, on the, re- the research side. And uh, I've got a, got a new book coming out on the on the, uh, on the popular side, I guess I have a, a book coming out in June, uh, uh, 2019 called, uh, called bring your brain to work. Great it's, title, uh, by the way. Thank you. That is the first title that I, that, that, ever, that, that I survived all the way from the proposal to the final book. Every <laughs> other, every other title I've come up with that, that ended up on a proposal did not, did not actually end up as the final title that, that the book had. Uh, so I'm excited about that, but it's all about the psychology of career management all the way from, from, you know, figuring out wh- where you might want to work and interviewing, uh, and negotiating for the job through trying to succeed at that job to deciding what to do as you move on, uh, in your career. So it's, I'm, I'm excited about that. I wanted to ask you one thing about your new book. One question that I, that I get asked so often, uh, from my readers is, for people who haven't really found their purpose, their passion, their one thing, there seems to be this collective problem that we are all waiting for this uh, epiphany of, oh my God, this is what I want to do in my life. And there seems like yeah. this whole confusion with everybody. Of how, but I, w- I was lucky because I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> so, I, so I had to do the psychology thing. And I wanted to ask you, what would you say to those people? Well, I, you know, one of the things to say is, is we can learn to love all sorts of things. And, and so, you know, rather than waiting to be struck by some bolt of lightning, you know, I think, I think it's also possible to take a job and work at it and put yourself into it and discover what you love about it and, and also what you don't love about it and try to craft Uh, opportunities to, to do more of the things that you love and, and to learn about yourself in that process, uh, rather than waiting for that moment that you realize, Oh, what I was really put on earth to do was some particular thing. And part of the reason for that is because if you, if you engage yourself fully in whatever you're doing, then new opportunities come up. You know, we, we're every organization, is looking for people who are willing to commit themselves to something. And so when you, when you make that commitment, then people notice and they, and they give you more opportunities. They, 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 they put you forward for other things. And so you, you have more flexibility, the more that you engage, not, not if you sit around and wait for the right thing, then you may not, you may not get noticed by the people who have that right thing. Good point. Um, for a person who is just starting, like they are, for instance, they're in a job and it's okay, but they are not really a high on life. And what would be a, a starting point for those person that you would suggest them look into? Well, I think there's two parts to that question, right? One is to, you know, to, 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 to uh, you know, early in your career to find people who have what you want. You know, to, 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 to look at the organization you're a part of or other people and reach out and ask them how they got where they are 
and get get advice from them, learn from them. I mean, we're we're a social species. Take advantage of that, you know. And and you know, the fact is that that uh, you know, when when you find somebody who's more advanced than you are, and you ask them for you know to you ask to talk to them, the worst thing they can do is say no, right? And 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 if you can get them to talk uh, with you, then you know, if you ask them a bunch of questions about themselves, you know, as you're doing right now, listen, you know that that people who who who've had some success, you know. They'd love to talk about themselves. So, <laughs> sure. so, so, you know, I think, I think that's, that's one piece of it is, is, you know, take those opportunities to learn from people. Uh, but the other thing is don't, don't give up on all of the other things in your life that you like to do. So, you know, yes, put in long hours at work, commit yourself to that. But, you know, when you go home, you don't have to sit in front of the TV or drink a beer or ingest some other substance to, to make the world go away. You know, if, if you're a painter, paint, if you're a photographer, take pictures. If you, you know, and if, and if, and if you don't have a, an outlet like that yet, then, then learn one, you know, that's, that's, I mean, I love, I mean, as I said, I learned, I learned to play the saxophone. I was in my mid thirties, you know, and people look at me sometimes they're like, how, how did you do that? I said, well, it's, it's, it's not obligatory that you learn every instrument you're going to play before you're at the end of middle school, right? I mean, you're, you're allowed to just take something up. There's no, there's no rule against it. And so, you know, and you don't have to be good at it. You don't have to be doing it for somebody else. You, you know, you, you can do these things for you to feel better about, about what you do. I think also a problem with society is that we romanticize obsessions so much. It's it's the classical, ah, you like to surf? Then you go, that, that guy like opens a surf house and he has to surf 24-7 and after a couple of months he hates it. It's like yeah. people really don't don't respect balance enough, I feel. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, think, I think there's a lot to be said for balance. You know, I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a whole big deal made about grit when, when, when Angela Duckworth's book first came out. But, but the fact is, you know, you should have passionate persistence for things except when you shouldn't, right? I mean, when, a, when, an, idea is, when, when an idea or a course of action is simply not going to work, you're actually supposed to give it up. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's actually fine to, uh, to, to, you know, to live a life where you work when you're at work and you don't work when you're not at work. I mean, I, you know, I go home, I come, I come to the office early in the morning. You know, I'm, I'm usually at the office 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. I will be here until 5.30, 6 o'clock this evening. But then I'm going home. Tonight I have a band rehearsal, you know. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, on weekends, um, you know, if there's something that absolutely has to get done because there's a deadline, I'll do it. But otherwise, I try not even to check my work email on the weekend. You know, it's, it, it'll, it, it will all be there on Monday. And, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm a better scientist a better communicator if if i if i spend every waking moment thinking about work this is a very good point because in, in my, this is something that i struggle with right now is uh because when you when you become an entrepreneur and when you are become a writer you you don't have those working hours like like normal people like sometimes it's very hard for myself to just say okay it's en it's enough for today because you have this huge anxiety war that no this needs to be done as soon as possible and until it's finished i'm not satisfied and this is one thing that i'm very cautious about when when i get people on my podcast is i don't want to romanticize people who actually have not figured out all aspects of their life in a way that they are not good husbands not good friends not good co-workers and they just have this one thing where they for instance make a lot of money but on all the other fronts they are failing miserably but i wanted to ask you in in your early in your early days for example when you made the decision to write your first book did you operate on a similar level or did you have had this kind of balance or do you need this phase of obsession to kick it and later you can pull off yeah i you know, listen i i think that i think that when you have a there are there are periods of your life work life balance and i talk about this actually in the new book work life balance doesn't mean that every single day is balanced or even that every single year is balanced. I mean, you, 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 know, it, it, you, you have to, you have to look at the, at the course of your career and, and be willing to, 
to make sacrifices in one aspect of your life in order to achieve something in another aspect of your life on an as needed basis. Right. So, look, I, you know, graduate school, put, I put in a lot of hours, you know, and 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 certainly pre tenure. You know, I, I, I worked, uh, I worked six days a week or five and a half days a week, you know, uh, uh, you know, full, full five days and, and, a, and, a, and a real, you know, half day at the office on weekends. Um, because I, you know, getting tenure was a critical part of that, of that phase. And so, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't as balanced, but I, but I also knew it was, it was a finite sprint, uh, and that, and that, and that that would enable me to that would put me in a position to have more flexibility later. So, yeah, I think I think you you make some sacrifices early uh, in a career sometimes to, to do that. Um, but but I think, you, you you know, you have to you have to do that mindfully. You have to you have to recognize, you, you know, you're doing this and and then you have to be willing to. To 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 to, to emphasize other goals at, at other points. You know, and, and, and so it's, it's, uh, you know, ba- balance is some, and it's, and you have to learn, right. It's, it's, it, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, what you were talking about, about feeling that, you know, that, that constant pull towards, well, I have to get this done today. You know, sometimes you'll be in a position where that might be true. You know, you have a, you have a big deadline or, 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 you know, some, some important thing that just needs to get done and, and, and you got to buckle down and do it. And, 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 uh, and, and other things in your life will will have to sit on the sideline and wait a little. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I think you also have to analyze where that's coming from, right? And, and, and you know, I mean, anxiety, stress, things like that, those are motivational emotions. They, they relate to, you know, there's, there's, I mean, stress and fear are, there's, there's a, you know, it's the avoidance motivational system that's kicked in. You have something out in the world that you fear that that is that you fear some calamity and you haven't yet successfully avoided it and you feel stress and anxiety so you have to ask yourself what is it what is it that you that you fear if there's a real calamity out there you you're going to have to work hard to avoid it but if in fact it's a calamity of your own making or a, a fear where, 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 where what's out there is is illusory then you have to learn. I mean, you, you know, and, and, and some people have to do that with help, right? I mean, with, 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 with advisors or even with therapists, right. To, 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 to learn to, 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 to deal with that. But, but yeah, but you have to ask yourself, am I, is, is, is the, th- is the calamity I'm afraid of really not, not actually as big a deal as I'm making it out to be. And, 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 you know, that's, that's where you, you know, when, when you learn, oh, you know what, I, I can take the evening off. I can have a conversation with friends. I can spend time with my family. I can take my kid to the amusement park and, and all the work will still be there and, and no one will have died, you know, then, then, you know, that's, that's a learning process. And, and you have to, you have to, you have to experiment a little with that and, and, and train yourself. Yeah. Okay. It's actually okay. If I, if I, if I hang it up at, at six o'clock tonight and don't come back until tomorrow morning. Great point. Um, for the students who are listening, I, I read this great book by Carl Newport, how to become a straight A student. And it's exactly about that. I always had the perception that the, the best performers work the hardest and that they had no social life and there's no success without like giving in into this one thing that you love and ignoring everybody else. But this is uh, apparently not the case, as you see in your case, playing the saxophone instead of like working till two o'clock in the morning every day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about habits. But sure. the, before I go to that, um, I don't know if this is too personal, but what, what are some dreams that you have for yourself right now? Uh you know, I'm I, I I'm I, I'm in a pretty lucky position in many ways, you yeah. know. But but uh, but I did just start this position at the at the institute, and and I'm excited about about bringing a community together. I would I would love to be, you know, my my vision of success for this is that about eight years from now there'll be a a whole community of people here at the university who who care and study about how to, how to help these rural areas to develop and, and, and that we will have developed some programs to, to make people's lives a little better. So one dream is, is, you know, is that I'm working on really is, is, is trying to make that a reality. Uh, and, and I, 
I just love to be able to continue doing the kinds of things I've been doing, you know, in, in my more public facing role. I mean, I, I'd love to have the opportunity to keep writing books like I have. And, you know, I've, I've, I've got my own podcast, uh, two guys on your head that, uh, that is produced by our local, uh, NPR radio station. And, and hopefully they'll let us keep doing that for a while, uh, because that's, that's great fun. And, and, you know, I think it's, uh, there are, there are just lots of things I'd like to be able to do. And, and, uh, you know, and, and I, I hope my band stays together because, because they're, they're a fun, fun group of guys to play with. What's yeah. the name of your band? Then? Uh, so the band is, we're a ska band. Uh, and we, we, the name of the band is Phineas Gage, uh, named after the 19th century railroad worker who had a spike blown through his head. Oddly it's enough, a famous case study, right? That's right. That's yeah, right. I know it. <laughs> Oddly enough, uh, I, I had nothing to do with the name of the band. <laughs> Somebody else in the band came up with it. But, uh, but, but that's, that's been our name for, we, the band's about three years old. <laughs> You know, we, we, we play some of the clubs here in Austin. It's fun. Um, Art, walk us a little bit through the process of, I think a lot of students like myself have this dream of one day solving problems on a scale. And you did that many times with your book and experience it, it, it firsthand. Maybe some of my anxieties uh, play into that. But it, for myself, it's a struggle right now, getting that first book out. Do we have any advice for starting authors who want to write a psychology book? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think there's a there's a couple of things. I mean, on, on the one hand, um, you know, you need you need to read and, and you know, a lot uh, it read probably four times more than you're writing, you know, in, in the sense of just just drinking in all of the things that other people have done. I think one of the hardest things about writing books for, for popular audiences, but one of the most rewarding is it forces you to really integrate the, uh, what you think is, is happening in the human mind. So paradoxically, uh, science tends to drive us towards very narrow problems that we're trying to solve because the leading edge of, of the field is involves answering a very particular question, you know, really the, 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 the head of a pin, you know, it's a very narrow question. And, and there's very little, uh, reward for thinking integratively across a lot of different types of work. If you're doing science, because it's hard to publish big, broad theoretical statements and And your experiments are all addressing very narrow issues. And so there's a set of habits you develop to think very narrowly uh, and specifically. And yet when you're trying to communicate something to other people where you want them to pay attention because you want them to live their lives in a somewhat different way, you have to actually think broadly. You have to, you have to think across lots of different studies. You have to try to figure out what is it that, that all of these different people are, you know, they're using different words. People have different names for their theories, but a lot of times they're, they're really talking about the same thing and you have to begin to recognize that and, 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 and integrate across it. That's hard because it's not something that we teach people to do when we're, when we're teaching them to be scientists. And, and, and so, developing that sense of, of how, how things work at a broader level is, is probably the single hardest piece of this kind of writing conceptually. And then once you, once you feel comfortable that you have a framework that you can use to talk about things, then it, then it gets to the writing piece, which is, that's the habit piece, right? Of, of, you know, every successful writer writes, you know, and, and, You know, it's the trick is, is not to edit before you write. It's to edit after, you know, I, I think a lot of times writer's block for people comes from this feeling that, that all of the, it's not that they don't have any language at all. It's that they hate every idea that they want to write. And so they stop themselves from writing. And, and I think what you have to do is just write. And, and you can, you can always, you can always throw away some things that you wrote or revise them or edit them. 
but but you have to start by filling a page with stuff no matter how bad it is and the the problem with with writing is that every example of successful writing you see is already really good so you don't see the million terrible drafts that somebody wrote and 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 the proposals that that didn't get accepted and the and 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 all of the 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 sentences that were poorly constructed all you see is this final product that's that's beautiful uh and 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 you you can't compare the draft you're working on to that you have to compare the draft you're working on to the last draft you wrote and and see if it if it's better beautiful there's a nice commercial with Kobe Bryant who talks about that people only see him playing in a game but they don't see him getting up at five in the morning running crying in the gym failing all over and over again and especially writers are very proud creatures in a way and there's this huge barrier because that I was facing was that internally you believe the stuff you're producing is not good enough you're not smart enough you don't allow yourself to put it out there even though it really could help some people yeah yeah and you just have to you have to you just have to be willing to try mm. and habits why do you think people fail so often with their new year's resolution <laughs> you know the biggest problem with new year's resolutions is that we is that we think of them on december 31st and we make them on on january 1st and then and then And then immediately we, we, we try to start changing our behavior when it requires a certain amount of preparation. It, it requires some time to think through what actions do I need to take? Uh, you know, it, it takes some time to recognize I have to be focused on, on behaviors on performing rather than just stopping some old behavior that I had. It takes some time to reorient your environment so that you can make your the desirable behaviors easy and the undesirable behaviors hard. I lately have been I've been on this campaign to try and create a new holiday. Um, and I haven't succeeded yet, but I but if I say it often enough, maybe it'll happen. So what I tell people is is uh, continue making New Year's resolutions on New Year's Day. Uh, but don't don't really commit to changing your behavior right away. I mean, make, make little changes, try some things, but, but spend a lot of time planning and, and observing your own habits so that you become more aware of when you're doing some of the things that you no longer want to do and, and really make your commitment about two months later. And so what I'm, what I'm telling people is here's the new holiday, um, on, on March 4th, right? So marching forth, uh, on March 4th, uh, that's, that's, that's commitment day. Right. So you, you, you play around with your resolution for about two months, but you really commit to it on March 4th because that's by that time you should have a good plan for for how to succeed. Uh, so that's that's my new holiday. I want March 4th to be resolution commitment day. I love it. I love it. I'm going to help you push it through. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think you get this question a lot, but as a guy who has studied habits and behavior uh, for many years, How do you design your own behavior? What do your routines look like? So that's a, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, you got to practice what you preach, right? And, and so, you know, and, and, and like everyone else, I can get into bad habits too. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had to, I had to re-lose some weight this year after, uh, you know, after eating poorly and, and, you know, but I, I went back to, to doing a good job of managing my environment. So, you know, all the snack food got, got booted from the house. Uh, you know, I made, I made a lot of, um, a lot of things more visible for myself again. You know, I, I got a, I got a Fitbit and, uh, and, and the app started tracking what I was eating. So I would be a little bit more mindful. I mean, those are, you know, I, so I, I certainly do those kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I do try to create time and space for things that I think are important. So, you know, when I'm trying to write, I, I, I will put it, I put, I'll put a little block on my calendar and say, okay, this is writing time, you know, so that I don't end up, uh, How long is that for you? uh, I can write for maybe an hour or two at a time. I, after that, I start, I start doing what I call fake work, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting at the computer and Googling things at random. So, yeah. um, you know, and I think everybody's a little different. Some people write in shorter bursts. Some people need longer ones. Uh, you know, so I think you have to learn for yourself what, what is, 
you know, what's an effective work strategy. But I'm, you know, and, and I think the other thing is, you know, I, I do try to surround myself with, with, with other people who are doing good things. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, as you know, with the story you were telling about, you know, when you're the best player on your team, you want to hang out with better players. And I, you know, I think, I think I'm constantly trying to hang out with, with people who, who have something new to teach me, you know, and, and, and that, that can come from all over the place. I mean, it could be a really bright student, you know, it doesn't have to be, I'm not necessarily saying, oh, I got to find the next, you know, the next person who's, you know, um, more advanced in their career than I am. It, you know, it's, it's just somebody who's got something to teach. And I think, you know, one of the mistakes we make is, is assuming that it's only older, more advanced people or something who have, who have something to teach us, you know, some, sometimes it's, it's, it comes from a very different place, you know, uh, very random too. I had three days ago at an encounter with a nurse and my brother is right now struggling with depression. It kind of runs in my family. And I talked to her that I can't reach him and he hasn't been coming to Christmas for years and he's isolating himself. And she gave me a great, a great behavior design hack is that you have to make it the, the, the appointment for your brother as easily as possible. So look for a restaurant maybe that is near the apartment of your brother. So he has to uh, put up as little as uh, possible motivation to get out of it. And I didn't think of that. And that was like... Uh, it was she wasn't a great professor, but uh, she was a cool human being. Yeah, yeah, and awesome. and you, yeah, you never know, and you have to you have to just be open to the fact that that there are going to be all sorts of interesting possibilities around you. And I, you know, I think to me, one of the things that I that I that I write about over and over and over again is that willingness to just be open to the things that are the possibilities that are around you, whether it's a random encounter with somebody that, that teaches you something interesting or, or, or a random request that gives you an opportunity to do something that turns out to be fun or whatever it is. You know, I mean, I, you know, I never thought I'd have a podcast or be on the radio or anything like that. And, and it really was, you know, uh, uh, just this happenstance thing where my, where, where, where we, uh, a friend of mine and I did a, an event, a speaking event, and uh, and the producer of that speaking event reached out to us and basically said, do you guys want a show? And we could easily have said no, right? I mean, you know, it, it's time consuming and, and you know, it's, and then neither of us has any experience in that. But we were, you know, we were like, sure, why not? You know, what what's the worst thing that could happen? I agree. Um, you also, something I didn't understand about yourself talking about random opportunities you have a gig on on the dr phil show right uh yeah so oh, so have, tell me that I, story i've been i've been uh, yeah so i've been on the show actually i've been on the show three times and actually i'll be on uh i've actually taped a fourth episode that's coming out uh around the launch of the new book i um so so about 14 years ago when i when I decided I was going to do more public facing work, I mean, I really was, was tired of people. What happened was I, I'd been watching TV and was saw yet another politician who wanted to cut funding for behavioral science research. And I, and I, I, he was yelling at the TV. I was like, somebody has got to tell these people why psychology research is so important. And I was like, yes, somebody. <sighs> so I, I decided to pretend that it was literally my fault that people didn't know why psychology research mattered and to see if, you know, what that would do. And I, I started, that's when I started uh, blogging and, and, and talking to people in companies and things like that, just trying to find ways to, to spread what I knew. And, uh, and I was at a conference, uh, haranguing, uh, this poor, uh, woman who was, the, who was the head of the Federation for the Advancement of Brain and Behavioral Sciences, which is a, a lobbying organization in, in DC saying, you know, psych, psych, scientific psych, psychologists need to do more work, more outreach work. And uh, the following week, she emailed me. She said, so how serious were you when you said that psychologists need to be doing more of this? I said, I said, why? She said, well, we got a request from the Dr. Phil show for people, scientists who might be willing to serve on his scientific advisory board. And I said, well, uh, I guess I got to do it right. You know, and so I, I served on his board and uh, I'm on his board now. And um, early on, he, he, he flew the members of the board out to, to Los Angeles. They, they tape uh, in, in the CBS Paramount lot in Hollywood. And um, 
he flew us out there and he introduced us to his his staff and and uh, and he gave us a behind the scenes tour of the offices and the show and we sat in on the taping of the show. It was a lot of fun. And uh, at the very end, he said, he said, yeah, and and you know, you don't get paid for being on the advisory board. He said, but if any of you ever has something you're you're you know promoting, let me know. And at the time, I thought, what what in the world does that mean? And then when I wrote my first book uh, for a, for a popular audience, Smart Thinking, um, I said, wait a second, I I have something to promote, <laughs> and. And, uh, and I emailed, I emailed the show and, uh, and they, they set it up and I went on and, and did the show. And, and, and now every, uh, I've had, I've had this, my fourth book coming out and, and all four times I, I've connected with them and they've, and they've been kind enough to put me on the show. So it's, it's, it's great fun. What a cool story. What a cool story. Uh, Art, I try to be uh, efficient with your time and respectful. Uh, let's move to the habit, uh, to the happiness section and then the short sure. questionnaire and then you are free to do uh, very important stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, what would constitute a perfect day for you? Uh, gosh, you know, a, a perfect day is it would I'd, I'd, I'd meet some interesting people. Uh, I'd have a little time to write something. Um, I'd, I'd read something interesting and, uh, you know, I would, I would, I would have some, some time to play some music with some friends and then, uh, you know, and then I'd go home and, and relax with, uh, with whoever's who, with, with, with whatever members of the family happen to be around at the moment. Most of my kids are out in California now. So, uh, but you know, my wife and the dogs, you know, we can, we can hang out too. Uh, that would be a pretty good day. That sounds awesome. I, half a year ago, I uh, yeah fell terribly in love with a girl, and I want to become a good boyfriend. Do you have any any habits that would contribute to me keeping this unbelievable girl at my side? Uh, you know, I think I think the the most important thing to do is is to remember uh, remember how much effort you're putting in now, and then keep putting it in. Okay. Great advice. Great advice. Um, if you would write a recipe for happiness and you could add one more ingredient, what would you add? Uh, you know, finding always find some new, exciting thing that you can do with other people. Awesome. And if I would ask you the same question, but you were doing a very unethical experiment and the goal is to make a person uh, depressed in a short amount of time. What would that look like? Oh, I, you know, just take away their agency. <laughs> I, mean, I think, I think absolutely the, the, the worst thing in life is, is not to have any, not to have any options. And, and, you know, I mean, that's the, you know, we, we thrive on, on, on pursuit of things. You know, that's the hedonic treadmill. You don't, you don't enjoy your successes. You enjoy the pursuit. You know, when, when people talk about life being the journey, It's, it's about, it's about striving to do things and feeling like you have the agency to be able to carry them out. And I, I think, you know, the, the, one of the reasons I'm so interested in things like, uh, rural economic development is because I think there's a lot of people living in, in, in rural areas who feel like they have no agency, they have no opportunities to, to influence their destiny, to influence their lives. And, and I, I would like to see whether there are things we can do um, at every level from the policy level to the psychological level to, to give people a sense of, of hope, a sense that, 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 that there are things that they can achieve and, 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 you know, give them that opportunity to, to pursue. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's interesting, right. That the framers of our, of our constitution and, 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 and the signers of the declaration of independence talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness not life, liberty, and happiness. Hmm. That's powerful. Meaning, meaning is such such an important weapon. I very recently talked to Jeffrey Jeffrey Cutler. I don't know if you know him. He, what a cool guy. And I asked him, and and he told me very randomly that in I think Sierra Leone is only one mental health professional. So students, if you're listening, there's a lot of work to do for us. And um, yeah dive and dive your nose into your books so let's move okay. to the last section the grow questionnaire then you're you're liberated from here <laughs> Fair enough. um what is your favorite word my favorite word 
Wow, that is a great question. Um, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. Um, my favorite word. This is, this is, this is. Wow. Um, I, I, and I love words, but I, I, you know, I, I write limericks for the for our psychology department. We have a we have a limerick committee. So I, I and I love crossword puzzles. So I, you'd think that a that a that a that a word would just leap out. But I, I, I just love words. I think, and I love I love words with multiple meanings. Right. I've, I've been a, you know, I just, I love playing with, with words. So I guess, you know, that's, so that maybe that's why I don't have a favorite word per se, because it's, I have, I have some least favorite words. Tell me that. I, that, that would be the next question. What is your least favorite word? Well, I, you know, um, yeah. So impact as a verb just drives me crazy. You know, when people tell me that they want to impact a situation, my skin crawls. I don't know what it is. <laughs> That is that is probably my my biggest pet peeve. Is yeah. there a noise you love? Is there a noise I love? I love music. I mean, really, you know, it's it's uh, so yeah. I would say. I mean, I I the reason I took up the saxophone is because I I love the sound of the instrument. I mean, not necessarily the way I play it, but but a good saxophone player, you know, that's a that that's a, a wonderful sound. Great book, by the way. The your your brain on music is really I can really recommend. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, excellent book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What noise do you hate? Uh gosh, I I hate the pitch of my older dogs barking. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's just it's got this whiny uptick. She's a forty five pound lab golden mix, and this very high squeaky bark drives me insane. Okay, two more questions. What's a question um, you think people should ask themselves more often? Uh, yeah, it, it, the question is, what question should I have asked? Mm. So, so a lot of times people ask a question because they're sure that they know what it is they want the answer to. And, I'll, and I'll, you know, when I, when, when, you know, I know when, whenever anybody asks me for advice, the first thing I do is to ask myself, what question should they have asked me? You know, because, because they may be framing The situation the wrong way and I think I think we can begin to do that ourselves too we start out by saying oh this is the problem I'm trying to solve um, this is the question I want the answer to and and I think I think if you take a step back and say wait is that is that really the right question what question should I've asked you you you, you end up in a different place beautiful last question then you are then you're then you got it if you put if you could put a life slogan on every coffee mug in the world what would the slogan be Uh, I, you know, um, I, I guess, I guess it would be, um, there's, there's always tomorrow. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. This was the interview. Uh, I will put your podcast link, your show, your books all in the, uh, in the show notes and yeah, I'm excited and I can't wait uh, to write down some notes because you gave me plenty of food for thought. Any last thing you want to say? You know, good luck with the with the work you're doing. Um, you know, it's it's always exciting to see somebody starting out and 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 really trying to to affect other people in a positive way. So you know, good luck. If there's anything I can do, just let me know. You just helped me in a big way. It's it, it really means a lot. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, folks, this was today's episode. I hope this could add some value to you guys. This podcast still is in this experimental phase, so please let me know what you liked and didn't like. You can let me know on my blog, danielkareem.com or on social media. As always, thank you so much for listening and tune in next time. <laughs>